Something's wrong with that kid. His head don't work, it never did. You better not cross his path. He's a chain smoking alcoholic sociopath. When Kevin was in grade six, the school nurse sent him to the dentist because his parents had never gotten around to it and because almost all of his teeth were riddled with cavities and really stained from all the cough syrup and nicotine. Mr. Spencer! Kevin thought the dental hygienist was prettier than all the prostitutes his dad had ever brought home put together. Hop on up here, sport, and Dr. Melthorpe will be in to see you shortly. Kevin's parents had never read to him or put puzzles together with him or anything else that required Kevin to concentrate much. So after about a minute, Kevin got real bored because he had no attention span. Kevin thought there were a lot of really neat looking things in the room. He decided to steal what he could and play with the rest of it. Kevin heard footsteps running towards his room. He wasn't done stealing stuff yet, so he figured he'd better hop back in the chair so he wouldn't get caught. Is everything all right in here, Kevin? Now, you be a good boy and stay in the chair and don't touch anything. Some of the equipment in here can be very dangerous. Hey, Psycho, even if you were older, she'd never go out with you. I bet she's laughing at you right now because she thinks you're afraid of all the dangerous stuff. If you want her to respect you, go figure out what that mask is for. Kevin wasn't so sure that was a good idea. The hygienist had looked pretty serious. Come on, boy. What the hell has he ever done for you? Please, Kevin, go try on the mask for me. Please. Come to think of it, thought Kevin, she never had done jack squat for him. Damn straight. Now come on, let you and me get it on, crazy man. The mask was hooked up to a big canister of laughing gas. The gas made Kevin feel real lightheaded, but because he was a sociopath who was born without the ability to feel emotion, Kevin didn't even break a smile. Alan sure had a good time though. Kevin! Kevin! The screaming dental hygienist snapped Kevin back to reality right quick. While the hygienist held his arms, Dr. Melthorpe yanked the mask right off Kevin's face and turned off the canister of laughing gas. Alan was sad to see the good times end. Ah, oh, crap. Damn you and damn your teeth and gums. You can rot in hell with the non-flossers. Kevin spent the rest of the morning in a nearby park drinking with some hobos and runaways. He was still pretty mad at the dentist for embarrassing him in front of the hygienist and ruining any chance he had of marrying her. Straighten things out. Kevin figured he'd straighten things out, so that night he broke into the dentist's office and got himself good and jacked up on laughing gas. He figured that ought to learn Dr. Melthorpe a thing or two. Then he broke a bunch of the machines and carved his father's name into the wall, figuring that the cops would bust his old man and get the useless prick out of his hair for a few months. Kevin was about to leave when he found the medicine cabinet with a bunch of little bottles with rubber tops. Kevin knew that the rubber tops were used to fill needles because he recognized them from the daily doses he used to get when he was in the mental institution. Kevin didn't know what Novocaine was, but he figured if you take enough of anything, it's bound to do something to you. Kevin figured he'd better get out of there before the cops came, but because he'd frozen all his limbs in his head, he couldn't move a muscle. This really upset Kevin, because he couldn't lift his arms to light his smoke. Oh my lord! Do you think he's dead? Dr. Melthorpe called the police. It took the two cops about 10 minutes to wake Kevin up. Because Kevin was so young and really groggy and disoriented, neither of the cops expected him to come up swinging. Kevin landed a couple of real sweet left hooks 
before one of the cops cuffed him across the back of the head and put him in handcuffs. When the police phoned Kevin's parents from the juvenile hall to tell them what had happened, Kevin's dad laughed so hard that he woke up the hooker. Oh, what's so funny? My dumb boy, no matter how many times you tell him the rules of life, it just don't sink in on account of his effing head's broken. If you're stealing drugs or booze, don't take it while you're still in the building you broke into. Go find a park or something. A lot had gone on during the two weeks Kevin was in psychiatric isolation. The prisoners had formed a union because they weren't happy with their food, living conditions, and basic cable package. Everyone was tense, and the prison warden was afraid that a riot might break out. Kevin didn't much give a damn, since the living conditions were better than they were at his house, and their TV hadn't worked in nine years. But Kevin went along with everyone because he wanted to fit in, and because the whole riot idea sounded like fun. Everyone shut the damn well up, or I'll gut stab you with my shiv. We're here to elect a union president. I nominate Slappy Bigelow. Before Slappy gives his speech, I'd just like to take this opportunity to say that if anyone opposes the nomination, I'll gut stab them with my shiv. Slappy had returned from the prison hospital while Kevin was in isolation. Slappy was still pretty sore from the beating Kevin's best friend Pete Wilcox had laid on him. He was plenty angry as well. Slappy had heard about Kevin taking control of the black market trade while he was in the hospital, and Slappy aimed to set things straight, so he'd be the big shot again. Nice to see all you folks again. As your union representative, I'll take a free minute of action and work in conjunction with the ward and the penal system as a whole in my endeavor to improve living conditions. I'll demand an increase in wages for the laundry and machine shop guys up to $1.50 a day. This increase will cover almost all my kickback money, leaving the working man with more disposable income for smokes and subscriptions to the porno magazines of his choice. Sweet. I will table the initiative to have the number of conjugal visits moved up from once every three months to ten times a week. Ooh. For those of you who haven't yet found a desperate pen pal or who don't have a legion of groupies attracted to their twisted celebrity because of the heinous nature of their crime, I'll see if I can get some hoes. I will also demand that the warden subscribe to the Me TV package, giving us access to 16 new channels that can only enrich our lives and aid in our rehabilitation. Now on the subject of bootleg liquor. The other inmates seemed really excited by Slappy's ideas. This yanked Kevin's chain because he really enjoyed all the extra cash and stuff he got from controlling the prison. Normally, no one would have sided with Slappy because Kevin's friend Pete would have knocked them three ways sideways. But Pete was still in the psychiatric ward for holding down the guard Kevin attacked and because he thought he was a border collie and kept trying to herd the other prisoners like sheep. Kevin figured he'd better do something right quick, so he snuck out of the meeting and went back to the cell block. Kevin went through all the other prisoners' cells and stole their porno magazines, smokes, and family pictures. He kept a few of the nice ones for himself and then hid the rest in Slappy's cell. Kevin figured that ought to straighten things out. Kevin was getting pretty close to puberty, and because his old man didn't want him turning gay, he decided to take the boy on a hunting trip to learn how to kill things. This here's the trigger. All you gotta do is just keep pulling it and pointing the gun. Me, I find it helps to swing the barrel around a lot so as you make sure you hit something. That's why we use automatic weapons. Keep it to Christ down! Oh, Jesus, Boise. You remember the reffing anniversary. Don't let no one ever tell you I don't love your old lady. Now here, you practice while I tear a quick one off with your mother. Top me up, Bill. Geez, we ought to do this more than once a year. Guns, booze, and no bras. You tell me this ain't the high life, and I'll kick your ass clean off. Top me up, Bill. F and you, I cut me off. The prick said I ain't made no effort to find the job. Ain't no jobs there for a man who wants to do an honest day's work because the immigrants took them all. That's why I ain't had no job for seven years. How's your boy, Percy? I don't know. 
10, 12 maybe? Yeah, it's time he learned some hunting. Make him a man is what it's gonna do. Damn straight. Got me up, Phil. Nice shot, Phil. All right, boy. The first thing you do whenever you go hunting is sleep off all the booze you drank driving up to camp. See you in the morning. Good job, boy. You keep practicing. Kevin had stayed awake all night because he was scared by all the strange new sounds around him and because every couple of hours, one of his dad's friends would wake up to go to the bathroom and fire off a few rounds just for kicks. Kevin's dad and his friends woke up just before noon and settled in to have a big breakfast and some boiler makers just to take the edge off. Kevin was pretty excited. He was really looking forward to sneaking through the woods, trying to find things to shoot. He told everyone how excited he was. Dad and his friends all laughed. Ain't you thought the boy nothing, Percy? He's young yet, and his head don't work right besides. That's why he's always in and out of the nut house. Good thing you brought him along so we can learn him a thing or two. Make sure the boy grows up normal. Kevin's old man and his friends told Kevin that hiking through the woods carrying all the guns and stuff was too much like work. And if they wanted to work, then they'd have jobs. Trick is to let the animals do the work for you. That's what separates us from them. We're smart. Phil and Charlie set up four lawn chairs in front of the cabin while Kevin's dad moved the fridge outside so they wouldn't have to get up for more beer. Deer's like salt. So the trick is to make a really big pile that they can't resist. If all you gotta do is sit in the chair and wait for them to come, you can get a lot more drinking done than if you had to go through the woods and try and find them. Look at this, boy. Watch how high Phil can jump. Mind you don't break my beer, you stupid things! <laughs> it was almost four in the afternoon and not a single deer had shown up. Kevin was pretty disappointed. The other guys didn't seem to mind as much, but Kevin figured that was because they'd been hunting plenty of times before and were used to it. And because they were all so loaded that they'd pretty much forgotten why they were there anyway. Hey, Percy! Ten bucks says you can shoot the side near of the car! Good thing the car's stolen. I'd hate like hell for that to be mine. Don't look like no deer are coming. Let's go into town and get some prostitutes. Kevin's dad said he'd have to stay behind because he was just a kid and because he only had enough money for one hooker. Kevin had nothing else to do, so he decided to have a few drinks and practice his marksmanship. But pretty soon he got bored shooting stuff that didn't move. Ostriches are your dad's favorite animal. Kevin figured he'd straighten things out right quick. So he hitchhiked 70 miles to explore Ed's safari world and whacked an ostrich in only 47 shots. Kevin figured he could have it stuffed and give it to his dad for Father's Day. Aha! Uh -huh. Now we're making progress. Do you see, Kevin? Killing the ostrich for the cry for help. On the one hand, because of your father's abandonment, your ego sought revenge by destroying something he loved. Yet, on the other hand, the very act of destroying was in your mind a step towards reconciliation. That was your aid at work. Directing an act whereby you could present your father with a gift of his favorite animal in the hope that he would in turn grant you the affection and love you wanted. Mr. Franklin sure liked to use a lot of big words. Kevin wasn't very good with big words, so instead of paying attention, Kevin just nodded his head up and down like he was listening and thought about all the good times he was going to have when he got out of prison. Boy, it sure gets hot doing your taxes all day. Yes, yes it does, because you were so hot. 
Why don't you take off your shirt while I discuss something with my maid over by the couch? I am very hot as well. I think I will take my shirt off also. We are all hot. It is also very hard work working as an assistant tax auditor. Then you should take your pants off. I will take mine off as well, so you won't feel uncomfortable. I think that will make me hotter. <sighs> because Kevin liked the fictional world in his head a whole lot more than reality, he figured he was real lucky to be doing 25 to life, because that left him plenty of thinking time. Daddy needs a new cotton of smoke. Take him in the head, you dumb bastard. Take him in the head. Chickens are so stupid. Kevin and Alan sure had some good times together. Kevin remembered when he was younger, and he thought everyone had an imaginary friend and that everyone could see Alan as well. He also remembered the day he learned that wasn't true and that his brain didn't work like the other kids' brains did. It was the second week of grade five. Kevin thought he was the coolest guy in school because he was bigger than all the other kids and because this was his third time in grade five. So he figured he'd know more and be a lot smarter than his classmates, except for the ones who could read. The first week of school had gone by really quickly because Kevin had skipped it and stayed at home smoking and watching showgirls over and over again with his dad. Kevin figured if he sat at the back of the room, Mrs. Kilborn wouldn't see him and he wouldn't be called on to answer any questions. It would have been a pretty good plan if Kevin wasn't a foot taller than everyone else. I'd like everyone to welcome our new student back for another kick at the can, Kevin Spencer. Not many of the kids waved or looked at him because they all remembered him as the bully from last year who'd beaten most of them up at one time or another because the people he really wanted to hit were a lot bigger than him. It was only five minutes past nine, and Kevin was already bored because he'd lost track of the lesson plan on account of his hangover and a short attention span. Hello, is Kevin home? It's me, Alan. Alan the Magic Goose. Can Kevin come out to play? Hello? Kevin wanted this to be his last year of grade five, so he tried to force Alan out of his head and concentrate on what the teacher was saying. I've got cough syrup and smokes. And two front row tickets to showgirls. Ooh, look, Elizabeth Berkeley's shirt got wet, and she doesn't have a clean one. I wonder what she's gonna do. Kevin figured a few minutes of showgirls wouldn't hurt him if he buckled down afterwards and focused really hard on his studies. That's it for today, kids. Remember your homework. Neatness counts. Also, the three students whose turn it is for show and tell tomorrow are Debbie Murphy, John Brooks, and Kevin Spencer. Kevin had forgotten all about show and tell, just like he had the last two years. That night at the dinner table, he asked his parents if they had any ideas about what he could bring. Hey! I know. Why don't you parade your useless, unemployed asshole of a father in front of your class? You can show all the kids what impotence and no job skills looks like. Hey, boy. Anyone in your class ever asked what a washed-up rodeo clown groupie looked like after it gains about 100 pounds? Because, brother, have I got a specimen for you. Kevin figured that the next time he wanted some advice, he'd wait until his parents were done fighting. That night, Kevin lay in bed with his stomach full of butterflies. He really wanted the kids in his class to like him, and he figured it would help a lot if he brought something for show and tell that was really cool and impressed them. It was a little after two in the morning when it came to him. Kevin had thought of the perfect thing to bring. He slept really soundly for the rest of the night. Thank you, John. Your grandfather's purple heart and the story of his courage will inspire us all for years to come. Kevin was really happy. 
He was sure that what he brought would impress the kids way more than a medal. He just hoped it would be better than what Debbie had brought. He was pretty nervous, but the cough syrup helped. Debbie, you may begin. These are so my friends. The prefabricated one-hit wonders, and the same thing only with girls. And that guy over there is the NBA scoring champion, but he's hard to see because he's behind the Archbishop's big hat. Any questions? Debbie's turn had lasted for over two hours because the kids and Mrs. Kilborn were so excited and had so many questions. After things finally calmed down, Mrs. Kilborn sent everyone out for recess and told Kevin they would begin with his show and tell subject when everyone returned. Debbie had really pulled out all the stops. Kevin was really nervous, so during recess he knocked back half a bottle of prescription cough syrup and killed a few smokes just to take the edge off. By the time everyone returned to class, Kevin was pretty loaded and he was feeling real confident. Kevin, you may begin. Kevin was loaded more than he thought because he fell a few times on his way up to the front of the class. When he finally got there, he turned around to face everyone and was about to begin speaking when he suddenly froze up with self-conscious fear. What if they don't like it, thought Kevin. Part of him wanted to run away and never come back, but Kevin knew if he did this, he would just end up dumb and unemployed like his father. Kevin decided to take a deep breath and go for it. He stepped off to one side and with a big dramatic sweep of his arm, he introduced Alan the Magic Goose. Kevin told everyone about his friend Alan and about all the good times they had together going to illegal cockfights and massage parlors. Because Kevin was so wired up on cough syrup, he didn't notice all the kids laughing at him right away. Then Mrs. Kilborn stepped in. That will be quite enough, young man. I suppose you think this is funny. Well, just you wait until I tell your parents. I bet they won't be laughing. <laughs> it was a good thing Mrs. Kilborn hadn't put money on it. Ah, Jesus, that's funny. I wish I could have seen it. Hi, my name is Kevin, and this is the ghost that lives in my head. None of you can see him, though, because you're all sane. <laughs> His head's broken. Has been since he's come out. I really don't think your attitude is helping matters. Look at me, everybody. I'm a magic goose. <laughs> Kevin sure didn't like the way all his classmates and parents had laughed at him, so he decided that he'd slash all the tires on Mrs. Kilborn's car because she was the one who made him do show and tell. Kevin figured that ought to straighten things out.